Okay, very good. Okay, so uh, thanks everyone for joining. And it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce to you Cheng Zhang uh, about uh, the talk here. So, so Cheng is currently a principal uh, researcher at Microsoft Research Cambridge, where she led the Azure team on decision making uh, with machine learning, right? And uh, she has done quite a lot of interesting work on, on probability modeling, virtual inference, as well as causality applied to machine learning, learning discovery, causal inference, and something like that. And today, uh, she's going to tell us about uh, deep end-to-end -end causal inference that also combines, you know, generative models, virtual inference, and causality. So, yeah, take it away. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, today, as Yunjin just said, I'm going to talk about the deep end-to-end -end causal inference. That's one of our team's recent work. And so I'm here just to talk about this work on behalf of uh, great set of colleagues. So this is a uh, joint work by everyone listed here. And so now let's get started. So if you have any questions, just to unmute yourself and, and shout. Uh, I cannot see the, the chat window uh, for now. OK, so why do we do that? Because in general, uh, on a daily basis, we all need to optimize our decisions. Right. So, for example, for business owners, they may want to optimize the decision like, should I give buy two for three or thirty percent discount? These are different kind of uh, incentive programs, but you want to drive the revenue. How do you get the highest revenue growth? Right. And for medical doctors, they may want to need to decide, okay, uh, is this treatment A or treatment B for this patient because they want the patient to be as healthy as possible, right, after the treatment. So from all different scenarios, we need to optimize decisions. And all this uh, actually boils down to be causal questions. So for example, uh, let's take the example of my other shelves. Should I take the buy two for three or 30% discount? So how can we make the decision? So if we know which is better for driving the revenue, it will be easy. So what we need to know is the average treatment effect. So what's average treatment effect is just, uh, okay, I want to see my revenue, that's like an X, Y, given like as a program by two for three, comparing to no discount, right? And then I also can compute it. Let's say our engagement start to be 30% uh, off and comparing to no discount. So, you know what, if we know compared to no discounts, apply both of these engagements, their revenue growth. So of course it's easy because then we'll choose the engagement that drives a better revenue. So if the average treatment effect of by three for two compared to discount, no discount is larger than the average treatment effect of the 30% off, this means this engagement is uh, a good policy to drive our revenue, right? So that's AT. And of course, then there is also other questions because, for example, in UK and in Fiji, the uh, like there is different culture, and maybe in Fiji it's more tourist people there. So does the same policy and same insight applies? So maybe we want to do the same thing. We want to compute what's the average treatment effect condition on the country. So condition on we're in UK. What's the average written effect for uh, by two for three or 30% off? And then we want to condition this if we are in Fiji again. So we can make such decision condition on where we are. So these are conditional average treatment effects so that it can help us to make a decision. So we can condition on arbitrary set. And if you condition on the full set, that's kind of become individual treatment effect, right? So you can just through these examples, you can see what's our goal if we want to use machine learning for decision making. So the goal is commonly we have historical data. And we need to specify what's the treatment and what's the effect. The treatment is. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, was there a question? Or just no idea? I'm not really, you can carry on. Mm. Okay, yeah. So uh, you can specify uh, what's the treatment variable. Uh, in the previous example, these are just the two different discount program. And what's the effect as a shop owner, maybe I just care about like profit or revenue. So you specify your question. And what you, you want to, go, uh, to do 
is you want to compute all these causal quantities, like the average rhythm effect or conditional average rhythm effect, because after you know this, it's very easy to make decisions. <laughs> apply this program for this shaft and apply another program for the other shaft, right? So this is input and this is output. So you must say that this is like a, a causal inference question, right? Because these are all the causal quantities. But for, for itself, causal inference is actually really hard because there will not be any shop at the same time having, like for the same item, have both discount. So you can only either apply 30% off or no discount or by uh, three for two. So you never know the ground truth of the treatment effect because only one action is given. So this is already a hard question, but luckily we do have a whole machine learning field called causal inference. And then there are many methods developed to do this. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later. But I want to point out one drawback is most of the existing causal inference methods is not enough. Because commonly, they require an additional input that is assumptions of the causal relationship in some form. So it can be the full graph or only the graph that is relevant. So let's say like, uh, what's the typical causal inference method? Why do they need it? It's because typical causal inference method have two parts. One is causal identification and the one is causal estimation. So what's causal identification is more like a given the graph. I want to find out the, the relevant terms that are relating to my computation, like the backdoor criteria and front door criteria, because you want to find out the partial graph or the variables uh, relevant to your causal question. And then after you find it out, then you can do the causal estimation. Uh, you can do simple conditioning, like just to follow all the, like a do calculus. I mean, there is more kind of, you can also use introduce a little bit more machine learning method, like double machine learning, et cetera, uh, after you do the causal identification. Uh, so that is uh, for different methods may use different identification methods. Like for example, if you want to just uh, uh, find out what are the colors, like kind of what are the confounding variables, and you can use double machine learning, or you can even use GAN based methods. So, the estimation method, you can have a lot of flexibility. There are a lot of advancement, but in general, you can see for all the causal inference method, they need a different degree of assumptions of the graph, or at least a part of the graph that relates to your question. But in real world, you can imagine this is not available. Like uh, if you go to a shop, they give you all the historical data with hundreds of variables. I mean, even the managers of the shop themselves, they don't know exactly what's the causal relationship of everything. Or sometimes they know they're not confident, right? So then it's really hard. And also it's not very easy if you actually want to use one of the methods, let's like say, we, we, we only require part of the graph, just let us know what's the confounders and what's the colliders. I mean, then you need two types of expertise. You need the domain expert who kind of know the business very well, potentially know what's a confounder and what's a collider. But meanwhile, you need this person to be a causal person because they need to know what do you mean by confounder and what do you mean by collider. So for a person running a shop, they need to be a causal expert at the same time, apart from knowing their shops. So this is actually not very easy to apply, uh, obtain for many applications. So that stops the real world usage of doing machine learning, like causal machine learning based decision making because very few people can do that. Okay, then luckily there is another field called the causal discovery. Okay, then they solve our problem because causal discovery is a different machine learning field. It takes a data as input and outputs a graph. So uh, as I assume there's a diverse uh, background in the audience, I'll just talk a little bit about causal discovery as well. So just letting you know how does causal discovery work. So in general, there are three big type of causal discovery methods like the, they are not mutually exclusive, but in general we say it's three big types. So they all take data, output graph in some form. So the first is functional causal models. So these are the models assume you have data, you assume certain functional form and you know certain properties so that you can identify causal relationship. A simple example is here. You can assume it's linear additive noise model, but the, the noise cannot be Gaussian. So this model is called Linga. So you can see in the second row that uh, like uh, you see the, the data uh, look like this shape. 
So if you assume uh, x is a cause, y is the effect, then you can do a regression y equals px plus epsilon. And then you can do the other way around. You can assume y is a cause, x is the effect, then you will do another regression x equals by uh, and plus epsilon y. So after you do the regression, you can look at the the residual, the noise, and the cause. So you can see only when the causal direction is correct, the residual, the noise, and the cause is independent. If the causal direction is the wrong causal, the wrong direction is anti causal direction, you can see that the residual noise and the cause, the assumed cause, is not independent anymore. So because we assume this function of form, because we assume the noise and the cause to be independent, so this assumption is violated. So only the correct direction fulfill this assumption. So in this way, we can identify the color graph. So this method, you can, this is a two node example, you can apply it to multiple nodes uh, using like ICA based method. So in this way, you can discover a color graph. And there is another type that's called score based. And the idea is very simple is in general, is you have the data. Uh, and with these variables, you can draw arbitrary graph, right. But so they show that if the, you define some score, and if this graph uh, explains the, the data in the best, fitting the measured by the score, this will be the best causal graph. So in general, there will be graphs explain the data equally well, and, and then these are commonly, uh, so this is proven uh, actually in this type of method, they will output something called Marple equivalent class. It means all the independence relationship are the same. Uh, so uh, um, um, there is a question uh, in the chat. So Mark, maybe can you unmute yourself? Unmute yourself? Hi, uh, is it okay if I ask a question during the yeah, talk? Sure. Yes, yeah, sure. go ahead. Great, uh, so um, can you go to the previous slide? So I, I may have missed this, but in the in the first case, in the Gaussian case- It's not um, identifiable. Oh, it's not identifiable. Okay, great, then I agree and I'm happy to move on. Yes, so for linear, so that's the reason why it's linear non-Gaussian. If it's a linear and Gaussian, this is not identifiable. The first row is anti-case, so why it's not identifiable. But meanwhile, so non-linear Gaussian model is identifiable. For a non-linear additive model, that's almost always identifiable. But this expands to post non-linear other form. But this Great. Sorry for interrupting. Uh, that helps. Uh, yeah, that helps. Yeah, thank you for the clarification question. <laughs> Yeah, but you, you see the drawback from the functional color models and all these color regions. You need to make assumptions, otherwise it's not always identifiable. The same here. So there are graphs sometimes explain the data equally well, uh, and it's actually proven to be the Markov equivalent class will explain the data equally well, so that uh, you will find the best of graph, but it can be a best set of graph. And then the last type is constraint-based method. So in general, it's assume, okay, all the nodes are uh, connected first, and then you start to do independence test. So as far as there is a conditional independence, this can all be causal. So you kind of remove edge as far as, it, let's say, A and D are, are independent given C, you can remove the edge between them. And so in this way, you can find the skeleton first. And after you find the skeleton, then you do orientation. So in general, you have some rule, for example, if C, condition on C, A and B are not independent anymore, so you know it must be a collider structure because that's only the case that can happen. So you can orient all the colliders and you can also orient the D because if A, C, D cannot form collider, it must be a train based structure. So for this type of method, you can imagine after you identify all the colliders, after you identify all the edge linked to colliders that cannot be collider, uh, not all the edges are necessarily all identified. So this also actually leads to Marco equivalent class. So it means it will give you a set of graphs. Okay, so these are the three traditional type of uh, causal discovery methods. So in general, they have different assumptions, different rules, different algorithm, but uh, it is take data, get a graph. So one of the big issue for causal discovery is a scalability to nodes, because you can imagine uh, like uh, this is there's with a node, it's a super exponential growth in the number of graphs. So that it's not scalable because you want to search all of them for all the possible DAGs in that space, even assume uh, you're having a, a DAG, a directly a cyclic graph. So one of the cornerstones of the work that actually 
contributed a way to convert it to uh, continuous optimization. So this is paper got no tears, that with no tears. So in general, you can see this paper's main contribution is just this, how to characterize a graph, it's a duck or not, and then in a continuous way. And so in general, this paper tells you like a you know, very simple linear case. So we want, we have this linear model and we just want to find the graph. The score is kind of the L2, right? And then you want, we want to constrain to a DAC. So we translate the DAC constraint to something like, as you know, it's only a DAC when the trace uh, of B is a adjacent matrix in this form, like the trace of I minus B is the same as number of nodes. So you can convert the B with the weights so that you can, you can make it into a continuous optimization. And so this, you can think about it both functional color model and score based because functional in the way that the, when they do the loss, they assume certain functional form. Um, but the optimization is a score based because it's not like use the independence condition to test again, but rather they want to find the best score. But this is a work, make everything much more scalable. Uh, why I mentioned this work is many deep learning based method actually use this method afterwards. So just a short break. So you can see this is a very, very quick overview of what's called the discovery method does. So it takes uh, the data and then it converts to graph. But you can see that they care only about a graph. So the, apart from functional based method and the sum of score based method, like they don't necessarily estimate the functional relationship, like how the parent, uh, child knows they generated from the parents. And they never focus on answering the causal inference question. So some of them may be easier, for example, if it's just a linear functional model, model you have the, all the parameter, maybe it's easier to extend to it, but you still need to do the extension. But, uh, but for other methods, for example, constraint-based, it's just a very, very far away even from answering this causal inference question, like a compute every treatment effect, et cetera, right? So great, we have these two fields. Seems we're closing closer to resolve the problem, but I want to point out some problem why this, uh, this is hard. So first, traditionally, the causal discovery and the causal inference, they evolved separately. And that's fine, right? So we have so many machine learning uh, problems. These are all important. Even within each of them, there are still a lot of answers of the problem. But there are a little bit more questions we need to think about because as I talk about, causal discovery, they take the data and the output graph. They don't necessarily output a single graph. The, for the previous example, I say it outputs Markov equivalent class, commonly is represented as CPDAC, is still a set of graph. But then when the discovery question got a little bit more uh, complicated, like uh, it can even output something called PAG, a mixed graph, that's an ancestral graph, and it can even be probabilistic distribution of graphs, right? But then for causal inference, you can see Although we say we need graph, we can use causal discovery, but they actually, most of the time, they only consume DAG, or they consume things that's like a, the part of the graph can help them to find out what to control, like what's the covariance, what's the instrument variable. So they need to find out the part of the graph that's directly related to the inference question. You see, the output of causal discovery and the input of causal inference, they can't learn the same thing anymore. And also there's more problems because you can causality, you can never do causality research without assumptions, but both fields make assumptions. For example, the first case, the functional causal model, the default one is linear non-Gaussian because as far as this linear Gaussian is not identifiable anymore or non-linear additive noise model. These are just examples. And then for causal inference, if you call many of the libraries, the assumption is actually linear Gaussian. Okay, this is the extreme example, but you see the problem, right? So if you want to connect the two methods together, but their assumptions don't even overlap. So you, it solves nothing because one method solves this part, another method solves the other part with completely not overlapping assumption. Of course, I gave a little bit more extreme case, but you can see even maybe for some other combinations, there is assumptions overlap, but the problem you can solve connecting these two will be extremely limited because you're getting the worst from both world, right? Okay, so then why do I talk about this work? Because 
we want to end to end a causal inference, right? From a user perspective, most of the people we talk with, they have data, they want to make decisions. They just want to give you the data and then you should output everything. You want to learn the causal graph, you want to learn the functional relationship, you should give the user the causal quantities and even, even recommend the decisions to them. So that's motivate this work. We want to solve this together. So we want to look at a single problem, we call it end-to-end -end causal inference, to solve a real user's problem with deep learning. So we put deep <laughs> before. So just to, uh, uh, still a, a little uh, preliminary knowledge. So in causality, we commonly use things like structural equation model to represent the, the relationship. So in general, it tells you, uh, given a node, it's a function, of its parents, so it's causes and with some noise. So it specifies a particular node, how it depends on its parents and the noise. And as I already talked about, so a very common form assumption is that the noise model, it just means the noise is added. So it's a function of the parents plus the noise. So of course you can relax uh, this assumption and have more flexible form, but this is one of the most basic form. And in this work, we're also going to start with this. Okay. And so, as we said, we want to do end-to-end -end causal inference. Let's start from causal discovery. So we take a kind of Bayesian score-based method for causal discovery, because as I said, like a, we can kind of define some score for causal discovery, find the best of graph. So we use a Bayesian score-based method. We define score as a joint distribution and the G is unknown. So we say, okay, we want to learn the G so that this particular score is maximized. And then you can see there is a likelihood term and the prior term, right? So how we define the likelihood, uh, let's start with uh, the simple one. So we'll just say uh, the PZ is uh, a Gaussian distribution with learnable variances, just a basic version. And then we actually use a flow-based model for the likelihood. So we define the transformation as this, so we can kind of transform uh, Z to X and then we can show that actually this is an invertible transformation as far as this G is a duck. So let's just rearrange in terms a little bit. So we can see that this recovers the additive noise model form, right? So you can see X is a function of other, if you know vector form, right? And noise is X equals FX plus the noise. So you can see that it exactly recovers back to the structure equation with the additive noise model where the G kind of tells you the parents. So it depends on only the parents term for each of the X. And so this is a standard likelihood flow based. So this is fairly similar to one of the related work called the causal autoregress flows. So this paper also used the same likelihood term. We kind of use the same, but I want to say that in that paper, they assume the graph is given and they only work for binary, like two variable discovery. So it's kind of a same graph is given, they fit two times and see which, which likelihood is better. Uh, but we use as a likelihood, we extend it to multiple nodes and we want to discover a graph. But the G, so as I said, the G is unknown to us, right? We want to learn it. And so for the prior, so what's our prior? The prior knowledge is this should be a dark a cyclic graph. So recall what I said, like there is this paper, the uh, duck uh, with no tears. So it kind of tells us a darkness uh, loss in some way. So because uh, if the trace of this term of the graph uh, is the same as the number of variables, it will be a duck. So you want this term to be zero, right? So this can be our prior. So that's the reason we construct our prior in this way. So we use H kind of from the no tier work so that we can ensure our graph will be uh, that. So why do we have two terms like this row h squared plus alpha it just to we use an argument like logic later to ensure it will converge to a DAC. And the first term inside, so g minus uh, w0 is just a, a sparse regularizer because commonly we can assume the graph is sparse. So we just put a small w0 so that you want your graph to be sparse. So this prior tells you the graph should be sp sparse and the graph should be a DAC. So Chen, can I ask a question? Yes. Okay, so can you go back to the slide uh, on the flow part? Yes. So um, you said that it's invertible if G is a DAC, right? Yeah. 
uh, that in multiple uh, skill, if G is not a deck, because in some sense, if you, if this is only in multiple when G is a deck, right, then uh, I'm wondering how are you going to do it when you put soft constraints? Because when you put soft constraint, it is possible that you're going to search for some, for some G that is on deck, right? Yeah, that's a good point. So it is just uh, later on in the training, we convert to a flow, but honestly, I think in the beginning, this is not, uh, that this condition may not be fulfilled to be completely okay. honest. Yeah. Okay, then I'll wait later. <laughs> yeah, so because you, so in the training, right? So so you have this prior, the kind of like the regularizer, right? So you will slowly become more and more dark, right? <laughs> okay, okay, fine. Thank you. <laughs> Not many people <laughs> realize it, but that is very true. But uh, in the end, so yeah, uh, we train it much longer, and uh, it is like when she become a dog, we still train it with them. <laughs> okay. So anyway, so for the inference, we still have the G, right? So the G is something you can, if from a probabilistic modeling perspective, it's just like an unknown global variable. Uh, yeah. So we didn't use anything fancy. We just uh, use very standard variational inference. Uh, we assume like a, a QG uh, and then we optimize uh, the evidence lower bound. So something fairly standard, just uh, use mean field variation inference to optimize that. So we, uh, as scholarly people, so we try to have a little bit of theoretical consideration. So I will not go too deep into it. So what we showed is uh, we have a list of assumptions uh, I will not go through them, but it uh, involves like all this in um, and all these things. So we show that uh, when we have limited amount of data, we do be able to recover the true uh, distribution of the graph. So in general, uh, especially here, we assume the graph is uniquely identifiable. So when they, we have infinite amount of data, we can find the true graph. So we show that in the in the paper. Okay, so now hopefully I show you like we have a method. We solve the at least the causal discovery part, right? We find the, the causal relationship because we train the neural network. So in some way we already have the functional relationship, right? And now is how to compute the causal quantities, right? So how to oh, maybe before you talk about that, I, I still have the question, uh still related to my previous point. Okay. So mm -hmm. I imagine. That if, that if you want an infallibility and also learnability result, right? So I, I guess your proof is actually two parts. One is to show that your particular model class is identifiable. And yeah. second, you want to show that this identifiable uh, class of, ma of models can be learned. And I say using some approximate maximum likelihood objective. Mm -hmm. That's my guess. Okay. Yeah. So um, I don't know the details for the first part. So let's just assume it is, it is okay. But still for the second part, right? It assumes that you need to have, say, valid uh, maximum likelihood or approximate maximum likelihood objective, where, mm -hmm. you know, if you start from a graph that is known that, mm -hmm. right, I will assume, assume that uh, how are you going, it's actually going to compute the log likelihood, right? So because the log likelihood time is actually going to appear in your VI objective. Uh, what do you mean? You mean like it just uh, one, the DAC, uh, one the graph is known that, right? Yeah, I mean, you're going to start from, say, a graph that is known that, that right? And you won't need to compute the objective to do optimization. But um, if your claim that this causal uh, autoregressive flow uh, does not hold, right? right? When you have known that, how are you going to even compute? Or what, what exactly are you going to compute for the log term in the VI objective? I need to check the code. We tried two things <laughs> in between. I forgot what is in the end. So apologize for that. And so first, I think we tried things, for example, because the graph is resemble the graph of the computation, right? So we can, we can then we just take the sample that. So when, when the sample is not the duck, so we just reject it. Mm. OK, OK. That was one thing we tried. Um, there are a couple other things we tried the trick. Uh, I think to project it to a dark space or something like that. Uh, okay, okay, I see. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm not sure which version is in our release the code. So please check our release the code, then you'll find the answer. But there was like this one or two trick we tried so that uh, we can compute it. Okay, 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 thanks. Thank you. So anyway, 
but now you see there are still open questions, right? <laughs> anyway, so let's go to the next part. So now we have the, the first part, like uh, we can discover the causal relationship and learn the functional relationship and how are we going to compute the other causal quantities, right? Okay, so because we have finite data, uh, what do we have after model convergence is we only have an estimated posterior. Uh, just a toy example, like uh, we have posterior kind of tells you uh, the left graph have 0 0.6 probability, the right one have 0 0.4. So it, uh, it's the toy example. And then the left one is actually happens to be the correct one. And so this is uh, our approximate learned graph, right? And then what can we do with uh, causal inference? Because we have different graph. I think being part-time Bayesian, we can just take a Bayesian view for the causal inference because we can put the expectation of the ATE given all the uh, larger graphs, right? So we just take the expectation for 88 and k and any of the causal quantities uh, over the approximate like uh, graphs. And this is a graph distribution. Okay, now we just need to compute what's inside, what's average treatment effect. So as we, we talked before, so average treatment effect is in general, okay, if we want to see the effect given a due treatment equals way A compared to uh, the effect given due treatment equals some reference, which we call B here. But okay, what's the due operation? So do operation in the end is you give a graph, let's say you do the treatment equals A, do XT A. What is happens is you cut the uh, incoming address that point you to XT and set XT to A, right? So that's a do operation because you set that to A despite other things. So uh, you, you don't consider the parents and then of course you, you don't, the information don't flow back either. So that's a standard do definition. And so for compute ATE, you just need to know this interventional distribution. So this is on the left side of the equation. It is the definition of the interventional distribution, like the, the one of the term of the eight. So how we can compute it is we can compute it just to means conditional x equals t on this multilated graph, right? So you literally just cut the graph for this treatment and set it to B, right? So that you can convert this interventional distribution comp computation by its definition. And in this way, oh, we can just take out uh, our metric class, the Monte Carlo estimation, because what we, we already have the graph, uh, the cutting the edge is fairly simple, right? You just in the G setting, the G is kind of a, uh, the graph represented at the adjacency matrix. So you can just uh, set, find the, the incoming edge to the treatment variable, cut them in the multivariate graph, set the treatment equals to the thing you want to set, and then you can generate the examples, right? So then in this way, you can just sample many of the effects uh, from this uh, graph that you cut uh, for the both first and second term of the eight, right? And then you can take the difference of the mean, and then you can get the average treatment effect. So then uh, this is with a single model, you can do this. And another advantage of such model is you can see that our model is trained. Doing compute the average treatment effect is fairly fast. You just need to do many examples and do take the difference of the, the mean. And then you can actually answer many causal questions at the same time if you, I say I want to assign treatment is variable one, or I assign treatment to variable two. So you can get a lot of this causal question answered fairly fast, just in one trained model, compared to traditional causal inference where you need to have a particular pair of treatment effects and you we need to re-estimate the model every single time when you ask a different question, even if it's on the same data set. Okay, so now we have our treatment effect, then we can get a, a little bit harder one. So it's supposed to be conditional every treatment effect because we want to condition on some conditional set. But now this is not so simple anymore because you condition on something and you may have you need to compute the probability like a, uh, the, the inverse one. So like a, you condition on something which is appearance, then you need to compute the parents given as the thing. So this is intractable. So, okay, that's a little bit harder than the average treatment effect. But as a generative model, what we're good is we're good at generating examples, which is our example a lot. 
So what we can do is we can train a surrogate model, right? So we can just train a surrogate model that we give a lot of con conditioning and effect, right? So we can train such a surrogate model. We can condition on things, give different <clears throat> treatments, and then we can um, sample things, right? So we can approximate that. Oh, this is, uh, I think it's better to be explained with this figure. <clears throat> so you can think about like a given a large graph. We can sample a lot of the XC, which is what you're conditional on, this conditional variable, like condition on UK, alpha G or something. You can condition on different samples. You can get a lot of samples for these different effects. And so then you can get this distribution. So you want to train a surrogate model that kind of just predicts the effect based on your conditioning. Of course, also give this to treatment, like you have an intervention and reference. So these are the two, uh, you generate samples for all this treatment equals A and treatment equals B. So you can fit this surrogate model because you have a lot of samples, then you fit your surrogate model. And then once you fit the surrogate model, condition on different things will be just uh, this dashed line on the surrogate model. So the conditional treatment effect will be just the expected, uh, the, the difference of this uh, expectation for this, like that's the red cross and the blue cross. So you can do this, you can do the same thing given different graph because your posterior tells you like uh, you have different graph with different probability. So your final k will be uh, the expectation over the graph again. So you have, your graph have different probability so that you can get the final expected conditional treatment effect. Okay, I guess we're happy here. So you can see we have the model. Uh, we're fairly happy. We can do end-to-end uh, -end causal inference, but we do have many assumptions. So, for example, we have uh, like a, uh, the assumption that uh, the base distribution was uh, Gaussian, right? So that means it is a nonlinear additive noise model with particularly Gaussian noise. And then you can also see that uh, the functional form and all this we're assuming we're dealing with continuous variables and also our proof only works for continuous variables. And also like we assume everything is observed. So I will not get too deep uh, in all of them, but in general, if you check our paper, you can find out we actually uh, extend, expand, uh, extended the model so that we can handle like uh, more flexible noise so we can just use blind noise. Uh, it's very simple. So it's just uh, at one D transformation from Gaussian with the spline. Uh, so that the model is more, more flexible. That's closer to real world need. We can also handle mixed type of data and we can also handle missing value. Uh, so you can check the paper for, uh, for this. Uh, but then more, one more point I want to bring up is you can see the whole thought, like uh, what we're doing. So in general, we took a Bayesian lens into a causal inference, right? So with this view, you can use it as a general end-to-end -end inference framework as well. For example, uh, for uh, output from traditional causal discovery method, a CP that can look like this, like left, right? So what does this translate to? It just tells you it can be one of the, the graph on the right, right? So uh, we don't know which one is that. And then in this way, you know, maybe a very brutal way to think about it is just that each of the graph have equal probability. And then we can still just to use a causal inference method to assume the graph have uh, all this probability, right? So we do expectation over that, or we can report a, a distribution that's just to be a mixture, right? So in this way, what's the key is you can allow any combination so we can use the whole DESI as an end-to-end -end causal inference, but you can also use this as a causal discovery method or causal inference method along. So you can use our model just for discovery, and then you take our discovery results, and then for each of the graph for example, you can put it in another causal inference method like a double machine learning. Or you can do like, for example, use a PC as a discovery method, and then we can take the PC's results I mean, in, in this way, we can take, we call hard prior or soft prior, right? So uh, hard prior just means, okay, uh, the, the G is given, soft prior means in the prior because we have the W term, right? So we kind of say this, this edge is more likely or not so likely. So we can use as a discovery method and use our method as inference method. 
And of course, then we can also combine traditional PC and double machine learning, just to use the same thing to kind of uh, average over all different possibilities of graphs. So this allows any combination. Okay, so now let's look at some of the results. And so this is, a, so we evaluate like a, against a different things. So first we evaluate only treating our model as a causal discovery model. So we evaluate over many synthetic data set, ER and SF are just to different ways to generate synthetic data. There is also two standard causal discovery benchmark data sets, which is the Sintra and Protein. So these are like Protein network and the, the June network uh, public data set. And so you can see our method, like uh, this is Desi with uh, spline uh, noise model. So that's the fl flexible noise because the data set have flexible <laughs> noise. That's a non Gaussian noise. You can see that the gray dots, that's the highest. So on adjacency orientation and color accuracy, that performs pretty good. So we compare with the traditional ones like PC. We also compare with like the no tiers, linear and nonlinear. There are also a couple of deep learning based color discovery methods. So our method performed best. And then we have the uh, parenthesis with PO means partial observation. So you can see the, uh, the kind of red, uh, kind of light red color. Uh, of course, the performance dropped a little bit comparing to the, the fully observed because the experiment is we dropped 30% of the data. But you can see we still perform better than most of other methods. Of course, the, the performance drop is due to the data volume drop. So you can see the method can handle partial observation. And then you can see like uh, the Desi G means with Gaussian noise because the noise is non-Gaussian, we're using the Gaussian noise model. So you can see the with Gaussian noise, uh, the performance is a bit worse, but it's still better than many uh, other methods. So for example, like uh, the linear method or some other method, right? So uh, you can see that this is accepted behavior. Like uh, we are a very flexible model. Uh, we are we give kind of current uh, state of our results for causal discovery on this type of task, uh, and then the causal discovery works best when the assumption and the real data generation matches. Well, okay. Just to clarify, so uh, when you compute these uh, metrics, are mm -hmm. you taking the graph that has the maximum Q probability? Yes, I think we're computing the graph with the maximum Q. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I think uh, if you check our code, we even have argument of different modes, so we can choose to sample the most likely graph or give an example many graph going to the distribution. And so I believe for this result, we, we, we use the example the most likely graph. <laughs> And another, yeah, I think in the paper we actually reported two two times. What we also did is we sampled the graph many times, uh, and then just to uh, compute the results with every example. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, anyway, two models exist. <laughs> Okay, so for the uh, the eight computation, like average treatment effect. Uh, we generated many synthetic data sets. Uh, you can see a lot of them in the paper, but anyway, so we want to show two nodes just to show some of the points. So we generated like a linear Gaussian, linear S, so like a, the first is linear Gaussian noise, the second is linear non-Gaussian, and the third one is non-linear Gaussian. So you can see from my introduction, the first case is not identifiable, the later two are supposed to be identifiable. So you can see the first case when it's not identifiable, uh, yeah, all these methods, like, uh, uh, because it's not identifiable, so uh, because then there is 50% chance it to get the correct answer, and the other 50% chance is just to get the wrong answer. And then one is compute to the eight evaluation because uh, it have like high uncertainty, and the eight is kind of not so great. Uh, but uh, if you give the true graph, the, the last uh, four rows, these are just a reference, means when the true graph is given, of course, when true graph is given, all the methods are really good. And so in the linear non-Gaussian uh, case and non-linear Gaussian case, you can see that our method performed fairly good, right? Because this is a case that the model should, should fit. And you can also see that our method, like the dark blue one, the DS, 
one, the DSP. So that is a, the R method with this flexible noise. So that always performs good. But if you see the, the first row, that's uh, the Gaussian noise. So you can see if you will assume Gaussian noise, but the data is not Gaussian, it's not performing as good as expected. But when it's nonlinear Gaussian noise, all these assumptions are fit. So you can see both the red on the top and uh, the third one, the blue one, all perform very good. So in general, the takeaway message here is the performance is as expected. Once the assumption fulfilled, our model indeed can perform very good uh, for both discovery and uh, the aid uh, computation. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, yeah. Um, in the two nodes, that just means there are just two nodes. There aren't any confounders in this experiment. No, no, no confounder, no, nothing. It's just the two nodes. <laughs> okay, got it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is a lot of uh, more with confounder, uh, like a simple a Simpson par paradox or like a large control set. So like, you know, you have a train in between for the confounder. So we have all this experience in the paper. Uh, the takeaway message in general is perform as expected. <laughs> so we also tried like a full tune of the causal inference benchmark, the twins and the HDP. So in general, you can see the takeaway is like the uh, DESI with spline noise is performing best. So the twins, I think Gaussian noise is also fine, but the HDP, the Gaussian noise is really not good. I guess the data set, I mean, when it comes to this uh, semi-real world data set, I think the, the noise are rarely Gaussian, but in general, if we compute like in the end-to-end -end inference way, right? So the graph is discovered, the, then we compute the average treatment effect based on this discovered graph with single model. So you can see the ATE RMSE is fairly low when we use this spline model. I think that model in general performed best. <laughs> Just to be completely honest, like uh, if you want to ask, there is also uh, sometimes the results a bit weird. For example, true graph plus this is fine. Why is that? It's because for this data set, they don't really have a true graph. They kind of tell you what's treatment and what can be preferential confounders, but this can be wrong. So it means that this true graph for such benchmark are not really the true graph. It's a little bit semi-human prior in some way like that. Okay, so then we actually have over 800 experiments. We had a lot of these different cases with synthetic data. We have all the benchmark data. So we had the rank uh, in general over the 800 experiments. Uh, you can see like in the top part, these are the different combination of end-to-end -end inference and the lower part is just if we give the true graph as preference. Of course, given true graph always perform better. Uh, that's expected because when we do learn the graph, it will make mistakes. And if the graph is wrong, the eight computation can be wrong. So you can see that when the true graph is given in general, like uh, just to use our method as the inference method, it still performs fairly good. And then you can see when the true graph is not given. So the best performing one is DESI end to end with spline noise. And the DESI with spline noise plus do Y nonlinear. Do Y nonlinear is just the means double machine learning. So these two perform similarly good. So this has a both top performing one. So it kind of tells if the graph is kind of the graph quality is high it's uh, something essential to ensure the the best causal inference result because the call the finding the correct graph is a prerequisite to compute the correct average treatment effect so you can see pc based or desi gaussian based uh with linear are not so good Right, and also with our method like a DESI end to end and DESI uh, and with double machine learning, the performance is not so different. We still have a little bit of advantage. I guess it just uh, uh, the model can be uh, more flexible. It's trained directly, right? But for double machine learning, it is a non-linear method. Given the correct uh, graph, this can also be performing good. But if you use just a linear model, the performance is not good because if you use yeah, the, the data set, many of them are nonlinear data set. If you assume causal inference is a linear method, of course the performance drops. So we also uh, did a lot of this graph, like these are the examples I show for the Kate. So we didn't show the two nodes because you cannot do Kate with two nodes. So all these, we also have eight results. So these are the two synthetic graphs. We want to show the one graph fulfilling the Simpson paradox. And another one is back, a large backdoor because you can control any of the nodes along this train on the top that will be a backdoor, right? So you can do all of them or subsetting them. 
And so in this way, you can see the case results. So we uh, here we show the results for the both uh, the two synthetic graphs I just showed. And then the yeah, so the, the other two are the twins and HTTP. So these are the more semi-real world data set. I think in general, you can see the end-to-end -end daisy with spline uh, performs best. I mean, uh, when the graph is not given, of course, it performs uh, best. When the graph is given, we need to compare <laughs> the ones with graph is given type is still uh, perform very competitive. You can see like we do the box plot and uh, just uh, uh, it's not always so good. There are some time because although this model is identifiable, it is nonlinear optimization. So in the experiment, we do observe that it can be 10 random seeds, eight random seeds performed really good, and one or two of them performs really off. I think it just stuck in some really bad local optima and didn't get out. So uh, this is also the method I still say for the state var, this still gave us a lot of good results. And this, especially on solving this end-to-end -end inference task, it gives super competitive results. But meanwhile, there are still a lot to, to work on. OK, I think that's the end of the talk. So just uh, in summary, uh, we propose kind of end-to-end -end causal inference because we really want to look at this problem as a whole instead of looking at either causal discovery or causal inference separately. So we perform, uh, we propose a specific, specific model that's called DESI, a deep end-to-end -end, uh, in causal inference framework. So and we have theoretical analysis and some real-world data consideration as well for like make the model more flexible. And this framework can also be considered as a general end-to-end -end causal inference framework. So uh, we have the paper on archive. Uh, I should change the slide because we have actually just released the code last Friday under our project repo. So if you want to play with the code, you're welcome to check our code. I think that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks, Chang, for uh, the, the uh, great talk. So uh, we, I think we still have around five minutes to uh, ask questions, right? So if you have questions, then uh, you can unmute yourself. Or if you prefer me to read all the questions, you can also type in the, type in the chat. So I guess uh, uh, you have a few questions to start with, right? So uh, first is maybe rather technical. So um, you have a result that show that he combined with do Y. So I'm just wondering what do you mean by say double machine learning? Ah, uh, so do Y is a library, right? So do Y is a library doing causal identification. And then do Y calls another uh, library uh, called uh, EcoML in Microsoft, that's called Alice. And in Alice, there is a list of the uh, method and double machine learning is one of the causal inference method under it. So it's just uh, a method name under do I. <laughs> okay, so does that mean the DASI framework is mainly for discovering the graph and then you use other library to do causal inference conference condition up? Or no, the DESI, the DESI framework can do causal inference. It's just one of our baselines. So the DESI spline is just uh, the, the whole causal inference, right? So I explained we can use our framework for, for inference directly, right? Uh, so yes. we are just com com comparing this as a baseline. So, so we can use DESI as end-to-end -end inference and that's a recommended way to use it because that gives the best performance. I didn't lose all the point, but uh, you can still use it as causal discovery method if you and combine with other causal inference. You can okay. disable part of our uh, method function <laughs> And the swap is uh, with other methods. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So I guess another question is more uh, general in the sense that so how accurate uh, do you have a sense on how accurate your causal discovery method is uh, when you uh, scale out the number of nodes, right? Because you know I guess one of the you know inter interesting mate between let's say you know people working on say potential outcome framework and also people working on causal discovery is um, you know. Uh, causal discovery methods can get very tricky to work well when you have a lot of no nodes, but at least many of the cases you have a lot of nodes, but you only care about, say, causal uh, inference problem, problem for some part of the, uh, the, the big structure, right? I mean, that is, so first, our method is scale up to a couple of hundred. Uh, I mean, for the performance, even when it's on the 60 some node, like a 
is let's say a 0 0.8 sufficient or not i think that's also a question right so where do you make the mistake if you make the mistake as a part that relate to your causal inference question that doesn't matter but exactly if that's a mistake on your causal inference question i guess that's matter so this metric doesn't tells you uh I mean, unless this is 100%, which is just <laughs> cannot be true. Uh, this does not tell you the impact on the causal inference because that relates to the question you ask. I feel for the potential outcome framework people, they, they are not uh, criticizing causal discovery, or maybe they are. Uh, I mean, they all criticize each other. <laughs> so for the potential outcome, they don't even think about graph, right? So they only, they, they only deal with single graph. They only deal with there is a confounder, there is a treatment, there is a fact. For potential outcome framework, they only care about three nodes in total. And this three nodes, <laughs> and accurately find these three nodes. I mean, that's argument for like, a, you know, in some domain, you can say, okay, that's possible. But I can also argue in many other application case, that's not possible. <laughs> And so that's where the causal identification come from, right? So that's about the, because a percentage outcome have this ignorability, which means like a, a condition on this set, covariant set, uh, like uh, the, yeah, the, the treatment. Okay, let me think. So condition on, on this variable set, the, the treatment is the independent of the effects, right? Mm -hmm. So that was the ignorability. So, I mean, isn't the backdoor? So, if the backdoor criteria find out, out the set and put it as a covariant, and that recovers to the potential outcome framework. I mean, there are a lot of debates about that. I will, I'm not expert uh, on commenting on, on this too. <laughs> okay, no worries. So, uh, Constantinos has a question. So, Constantino, can you, you can unmute yourself? Hello, thank you very Hi. much thank you for the presentation. So I'm uh, I'm not knowledgeable much with, about causality, so excuse if it's a naive question, I'm still learning. So you said uh, the um, at the beginning, causal inference requires the DAG. Uh, for the for causal discovery, you have, I think, certain other assumptions. So now I'm trying to figure out, uh, now that you're doing end-to-end, -end, can you summarize as a user, sorry, a user, someone that has data and wants to try to uh, do end-to-end -end discovery plus inference, your framework, mm -hmm. what should they already know about the data? So they don't need to know the DAG, but what do, do they know? For, do they need to know, for example, the family of functions uh, between the variables or the type of noise? Or can you summarize this? Yeah, so I mean, for our framework, currently we assume it's additive noise model. And uh, right, so this is something, uh, I mean, uh, you can choose whether we use the Gaussian noise or non Gaussian noise, but I feel in real world we can just assume it's non Gaussian, right? But uh, I feel these are the things as a, you know, assumption verification, right? So for our method, we need it to be true for the model to be additive noise model. But I feel only having the data is fairly hard to, to verify such assumptions. Uh, as a user, in some way, it's like a kind of if you believe that, you can just run it and you get the results. Uh, but uh, I don't Sorry, know. Sorry, say it again. You said it's difficult to verify such assumptions. As a user, you would do what? You just run it, right? So you, you you try you try and see what happens basically. That's what exactly. You yeah, just okay. try what happens, right? So because the assumption, uh, there's no way I feel to verify the, the noise is indeed additive. <laughs> I mean, you can yeah. run it, you see the result, you see what's the noise. If they're independent, you kind of have some post analysis. Um, but I think just given the data, just to say without running anything, I think it's a little bit hard. It is hard to have an intuition about the noise. Yeah. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, Anish, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, I just wanted to ask about the causal discovery bit. Um, I think you mentioned that obviously you want to find the graph within a, a Markov equivalence class. And you said you use the um, amortized flows method. Can mm -hmm. you talk about why you use that and what assumptions are required for identifying within the Markov equivalence class? Oh, okay, so for our method, just so this is one of the first method doing deep end-to-end -end causal inference, or the first method doing deep end-to-end -end causal inference, we actually not operating on macro equivalence class. 
we actually, because we use nonlinear additive noise model, our graph is uniquely identifiable. So we actually, in our, because we have the nonlinear additive noise model assumption, we currently do not output Marco equivalent class. So we have ongoing research on how to modify it to output Marco equivalent class because when it's a linear noise model, then you have to output Marco equivalent class. Or there's other things like when there is uh, latent commanders, you have to output a pack, right? So, so currently we're not dealing with that situation. And then this will just be a unique tag. We assume a unique tag will be able to find it. And then, yeah, the DAC is just represented by adjacency matrix. And then you, you learn. <laughs> All right, got it. Thanks. OK, I guess uh, if there's no more questions, I think that uh, we can call your day. But uh, yes, thanks a lot, Chang, for the great presentation. I think uh, I enjoyed uh, a lot. And I'm hoping that the audience will also enjoy it. So thanks, everyone, for coming. So this concludes the talk. <laughs>